All right. Uh, this is the only take because <laughs> who cares, right? Did you know that there's not just one kind of Darjeeling tea? I'm not talking about differences in cultivars, but about differences between harvests or flushes, each of which has slightly different traits due to climate and season, differences which are further exacerbated by processing. This is just one of the ways the rotation and tilt of our earth, the changing weather, and other factors can affect the ways we live our lives. The tea-producing estates in the Darjeeling region must match their schedules to the ebbs and flows of climate. If you're watching this video just after release, it's just been Lunar New Year too, in the most lenient sense of the word, since my phone broke immediately before I was due to film the video and I needed to delay production by about a week. In any case, Chunjie's exact date varies from year to year, because it's defined in terms of traditional lunisolar calendars used in East Asia. This is also deeply linked to the connection between the seasons, nature, and agriculture. In Chinese, the traditional character is known as the Nongli, literally farming calendar. But it's not just nature that defines our connection to time, is it? In 2019, the Norwegian island of Samurai announced to news media outlets that it intended to declare itself a time-free zone, the rationale behind this decision being that for the Arctic island, there's very little variability in sunlight for very long periods of time. In Samurai, two months of the year are spent in constant darkness, and another two in constant daytime. The reaction to this announcement was explosive. We discussed it in school, it went viral on social media, articles and op-eds were written. Of particular note is this thread on slash r slash not the onion, which reached 20,000 upvotes and received nearly a thousand comments. The tone of the comments varies, with some people praising the move as a bold, innovative experiment in work-life balance, and some taking a decidedly harsher perspective. So how do you agree to meet people? How do kids know when to go to school? I mean, sundials still work there, right? Without some idea of time, it's very difficult to plan for any future events, or anything that requires working with other people. Boss, sorry I'm late, I was vacationing in Norway and they lost track of time. Tom Scott is gonna have a field day with this. After the furor died down, it became clear that this supposed bold social experiment in Norway had been a publicity stunt slash hoax by government-run company Innovation Norway, intended to advertise tourism in the country's north. Swift retractions followed from a variety of news outlets, including the New York Times, NPR, and The Guardian, who had taken the story and run with it, not realizing it was technically misinformation. All in all, the campaign garnered an estimated $11.4 million worth of publicity. So, assuming statements about multi-month days and nights in Samare were accurate, then why did people find the idea of doing away with time entirely so implausible? It's my opinion that the mass disbelief following the Time Free Zone marketing campaign illustrates one thing very clearly. Time in its modern day context doesn't necessarily have anything to do with climate or the cycle of day and night. So, if we've become entirely unmoored from this loony solar standard of timekeeping, what exactly does time represent in modern society? We can start by looking at some time change related policies that have been successful in the past. First of all, daylight savings, which, to be honest, I hadn't really encountered before I moved to the UK. Daylight savings time is when a country collectively agrees to move its clocks forward by an hour for a portion of the year, in order to allow its citizens better access to morning daylight by encouraging them to wake an hour early. The synchronized changing of clocks means that existing regularly scheduled events, such as going to work, can theoretically occur at the same time, despite happening during a different part of the day. Usually these measures are regular and cover only a portion of the year. And I can almost hear it now. There's going to be like some comment written. What about Venezuela? It's a risk that comes with being on this side of YouTube, isn't it? In 2007, South American country Venezuela changed its time zone permanently, putting itself 30 minutes out of sync with its nearest neighbors. Again, ostensibly for the purpose of better utilizing morning daylight. However, in the wake of an energy crisis in 2016, the change was reversed, ensuring more daylight in the evening to save resources. 
Possibly the most extreme example I can think of is December 29th, 2011, when the island nation of Samoa jumped across the international date line, skipping directly over the 30th and moving straight into the 31st. This was justified as a measure to improve trade relationships with countries like Australia and New Zealand, with Samoa's Prime Minister saying the following of the matter. While it's Friday here, it's Saturday in New Zealand, and when we're at church on Sunday, they're already conducting business in Sydney and Brisbane. I think what we can learn from these examples is that the measurement of time is a malleable thing. It can and has been altered when it's compatible with people's work schedules, and when it's economically beneficial for a given country. It could thus be argued that the keeping of time is to some degree mainly a method of regulating the pace of human behaviour. Not necessarily through overt force, but through social pressure and the relative infeasibility of not conforming to national and global standards. In secondary school, one of the texts my English class studied was Dai Si Jie's Balzac and the Little Chinese Seamstress, a novel about Chinese teens sent to do fieldwork in the countryside during the Cultural Revolution. These young intellectuals, initially sent to learn agricultural skills from the local people, end up bringing a variety of modern things to the village they stay in, including violin music such as that of Mozart, Western literature such as that of Balzac, and some weird, weird imagery. However, the thing that captures the villagers' fascination the most is one main character's little alarm clock. While the village headman initially intends to confiscate items with bourgeoisie associations, the clock fascinates him as it gives him a sense of power. Having a method of measuring time means that it's possible to demand that workers wake up on time, head to work on time, and stay at work for a particular duration and that when the headman does so, there's a sense of legitimacy to his actions. After all, he's just enforcing a rule. Thus, while the same amount of work presumably needs to be done before and after the clock's arrival, the workday is now objective, factual, and, most importantly, worked on his terms. Now, I can't say that I agree 100% with all of this book's key themes. And to be honest, I don't even think it's that good of a book. I know when I first read it, at least, I found it kind of dull. But it's always kind of intrigued me, the complexity of this power dynamic. And it really goes to show how powerful a clock can be as a centralizing force. The introduction of rigorous timekeeping into this environment distorts the way time is understood and creates an approximation of the capitalist working day, as described by anarchist thinker George Woodcock in his essay on the tyranny of the clock. Fieldwork inevitably makes way for the factory lifestyle, because if time can be measured, it can be sold, exchanged, or even demanded. It's because of time's increasing dominance over our world that I'm somewhat skeptical of the idea of time management. Rather, we allow time to manage us. In my leisure time, I stay up later than I should, anxious about the morning's work, too guilty for being idle to enjoy myself, but also too tired to actually do any productive work. Then, every day I wake up in the afternoon and find my insomnia has left me sleepy and spent, so I idle until it's night and the cycle repeats itself. It's enough to make you want to turn to drink, and by drink I mean caffeine. It's no coincidence that coffee has become symbolic of productivity culture. It's the workaholic's drink of choice, you know? Don't even talk to me unless I've had my morning coffee. Caffeine is a neat trick that lets you steal time from yourself, in a sense, keeping you alert when you need to be productive, only to bring a slump of equivalent or worse proportion later in the day, when you can afford to feel terrible because it's your problem now. It's almost like self-medicating, chemically bringing the rhythm of your body in line with the pendulum swing of the working day. Although, it's more than that, isn't it? I mean, as a tea drinker, I'm not really that much better. I used to stress eat, now I stress drink. It's not just chemical. 
The two most common kinds of break you get at work are for coffee and for lunch, because we need to eat and drink, and it's difficult to work while you do that. So you can have a tiny bit of time off. Maybe that's why I'm so pro-teapot and anti-tea bag. At least I get some level of choice in my weird little ritual. <laughs> So, not long after I got to the UK, I went to a GP and asked to be referred for an adult ADHD diagnosis on account of my annoying tendency to space out and lose track of time. She obliged, but as with all non-urgent healthcare, huh, I was put on a waiting list. That's not the full story exactly, but I need to cut details because, you know, tea will only steep for so long, We've, we're on a clock here. Basically, the process of getting diagnosed with ADHD in the UK is complicated in ways that seem specifically designed to lock out the exact people experiencing the symptoms associated with ADHD. Anyway, waiting lists. We accept them as a given, don't we? We live in a society and we can't expect demand for most things to be constant. If there's a greater demand than can be supplied for a given service at a certain time, a backlog is built up, and then when demand is lower than supply, that backlog is worked through until you're keeping pace. Virtual queues can ensure that a service is always being used to its fullest extent. At least, that's how it works in places like McDonald's and Disneyland. However, not everywhere is Disneyland, and there are places where waiting lists are in use in a way that's either ill-fitting or actively malicious. In 2020, the BBC found that over 21,000 adults were on waiting lists for ADHD services, with wait times up to and above five years. One patient quoted by the BBC says that they were told to expect a two-year wait for diagnosis, and I can believe that because I was told the same thing, and that such a wait was normal and to be expected. In fact, I was even told to keep my local health board updated on my address, not in case I moved off campus before being seen, but because my GP believed that it was inevitable that that would happen. Similarly, as of 2019, over 13 and a half thousand people were on waiting lists for gender identity clinic appointments, with an average waiting time of 18 months and no sign of improvement. Some people wait anywhere from two to five years for a first appointment, with no other options beyond costly private healthcare and self-medication. This isn't just a medical catastrophe, although it is that. I also find it deeply philosophically distressing. A waiting list of such absurd proportions, and one that doesn't actually get any shorter, is like a magician's trick. It can't actually do anything to improve a system's throughput, like better funding or more clinics would, so it just hides vast numbers of people in need of medical care in a hidden compartment of sorts, a vast liminal space-time. The way Western cultures treat time on a longer scale is interesting in general, as it comes underpinned with a vast variety of assumptions. Nowadays, we count years in terms of AD, Anno Domini, and BC, before Christ, which uses the birth of Christian prophet Jesus Christ as the reference point from which we count. Thus, cultures are understood to be more ancient the further they are from Christianity's inception, and long-lasting pre-Christian cultures are kind of lumped together as a generic non-Christian mush. The trendy rebranding of Anno Domini as Common Era doesn't fix this either, as the very act of counting forward implies a slow, inevitable, and desirable progress. An arc of history. The forward counting of the calendar coinciding with the spread of Western dominance over history and industrialization reinforces the belief, most notably held by Evo Psych Weirdo and Bestie of Jeffrey Epstein, Steven Pinker, but realistically also having been internalized at some level by most of you and also me, that our way of life, the centralization of resources in former colonial powers, is generally better for everybody, and that all historical events, even the bad ones, are overall a net good. To sum up, 
The keeping of time, at least as it relates to society, is more malleable than one might initially believe, and connected less to regular natural phenomena and more to the complex network of interactions we know as society. The recording and enforcing of time is therefore not objective and can be altered for the convenience of those who hold a certain amount of power or influence over others, such as the state. Furthermore, timekeeping as it currently exists is a practice that can be harmful for work environments and the individuals. The introduction of clocks has radically changed the shape of our society and the way we conceptualize work, and represents a significant transfer of power towards employers. Furthermore, there is a pressure to alter our habits, and even our chemistry, inside and outside of work, to ensure we're making the most of our time. Beyond the hour-to-hour time that manages our workdays, the importance of time is also felt on a larger scale. One example of this is how long wait times hide inaction and the denial of service to those most in need of it, by insisting that people will be helped at an indefinite point sometime in the future. Another example is how the words and methods we use to describe the long-term passage of time can reinforce the dominance of colonial powers, and imply that the current day state of affairs is both inevitable and desirable. Ergo, it is imperative that we recognize the underlying assumptions of our relationship with time are toxic, and attempt to build new understandings of it within our communities. I don't mean to imply that we should stop measuring time personally, it's a useful tool, but that we should strive to build a healthier relationship with it. This could mean anything from pursuing more lenient hours and deadlines through collective action, or committing to some unstructured time with friends and loved ones, or even just taking a nap now and then to remind ourselves that time not spent productively isn't necessarily wasted. One thing that I've been doing recently, at least, is streaming Pokemon Silver on Twitch with a really punishing challenge rule set that bans damaging moves, you know, as an experiment in patience and being more okay with wasting time. I won't lie, it's been slow going so far, I've still not managed to beat youngster Joey, but what have I really got to lose, right? I'll get there eventually, I'm certain of it. Thanks for waiting so long between posts. I've been going through a period of massive personal change and hadn't felt ready to write and produce a video until now. I'm experimenting with different approaches to creating stuff, including coursework and extracurriculars, that's you, and it seems to have paid off, given that I've managed to write and film this video without sacrificing weeks of my time and imploding my life like I did for the last four. My big goal, however modest it might sound, is to put out more than two videos this year, and for the first time in a while I think that might actually be feasible. Right, until next time, bye! <laughs> Oof.